Well, before we move forward, we're going to tell you a little bit about Angel Tree, something that the church has been involved in for 11 years, providing Christmas for families. There's a Local mic. Families. Local families. Yes. This, this service, we're going to have you put the mic up a little <laughs> closer. I was plenty loud enough last time. <laughs> this is oh. Carrie Walker. So Good she morning. heads up Angel Tree for Riverside. Yes. Um, we've been doing this for 11 years, as he said, so most of, in, most of you in here probably know the drill, but I'm going to run through it with you really quickly. Um, you probably see angel tree tags um, hanging like on trees in Walmarts and things like that um, during this season, and you can adopt a child, a local child, that otherwise wouldn't have Christmas to, um, unless we sponsor them. Um, on, the tra on the tag, it has their wants their wishes, and their sizes of what they wear, things like that. So what our church has done um, all these years is adopt um, a bunch of children. This year we have 22. Um, and we break it down so that you do not have to be responsible for an entire child's Christmas. Um, so for each child, we do three toys or whatever they ask for in their wishes and wants. Um, we do two outfits with shoes, and we do a winter coat. Um, we get the larger families, we choose the larger families so that we know these kids have three, four, five kids in a family, um, that they are all getting kind of equal amounts of stuff. Um, so as you came in, you saw it already set up back there, but, um, we have everything broken down so you can choose just one thing or three or four things, but you don't have to, uh, sponsor an entire child. So... You're going to pick um, the ornaments, show what um, you're choosing to buy, and then the ornament goes on the tree, and that's just a visual of showing all the things that people have picked out. And you take the index card with you. On the index card, it's going to have the name of the child, how old they are, their gender, what you signed up to get, and the date that it's due, which is de December 1st. Um, keep that index card when you bring the gift back. Keep, um, do not wrap it, leave everything unwrapped, and stick the index card down in the bag. That helps us know exactly who that child's for, who that gift is for. Um, unwrapped, I said that. What am I missing? Oh, make sure you do age appropriate. So there's a lot of kids that want Legos, but there's three-year-olds that want Legos, and there's 12-year-olds that want Legos. So just keep an eye on the age of the child. It's on your card and the gender, and, um, and just buy age appropriate gifts. Um, I think that's it. Make sure that you, one thing I didn't say in the earlier service, um, make sure you let us know what you choose. Um, we do keep a, a list of all the names so that if we don't get everything back by December 1st, we'll reach out to you and remind you that we need to get it back. Um, but I think that's it. Did I forget the Riverside anything? Collection Department will be on you if you don't bring yeah. it back. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you can so. pick up the stuff today on your way out, mm -hmm. and which usually everything's chosen the very first Sunday that it's available. Bring it back so. December 1st. By December 1st. Yeah, you can bring it back next Sunday, any Sunday between now and December 1st. That's yeah. when we need to have everything back so we can get it organized. And, and we just put it all in the church office. So yes. Yeah, just bring it out. Yeah. Any other questions? I'll be back there. You guys can ask me. Um, but yeah, that's fun. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. I, when I was walking around Journey, I saw Isaiah and Caitlin back there. They just got married Friday right here. So they're, yeah. They said, we want our honeymoon to be in church. And so <laughs> anyways, good for them. Sure. So we're on a little journey together. Um, the goal of this journey, first part of the journey anyways, is learning to be with Jesus. Taking intentional time during your day to be with Jesus. To sit down with his word. To sit down and talk to him. To listen to what he says back to you. To allow him to start forming you into the human being that he designed for you to be. So my question is, are you spending time with Jesus? Because people can tell if you have been or haven't been. You know, we've been just through a week of political angst through elections and things like that. And somebody may look at you and say, well, you didn't seem to get ruffled about anything. 
And you could say, well, because Jesus is the vine and I'm the branch and he's my source, you know, uh, the political parties are not my vine. I'm not a branch of them. I'm not a branch of these candidates. I'm a branch of Jesus. Or, or somebody might say, you know, you've been making some really good decisions in your life lately. And you could say, it's because I've been spending time with Jesus and he's my good shepherd. And as a shepherd, he is protecting me and caring for me and leading me to the good life. Or somebody might say to you something like this, boy, you seem to have a really ch big change of attitude. And you could say, well, because Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And I have seen what he can do. And so why should I be downcast? I should be happy in the Lord. Today, we're going to look at another one of these I am statements Jesus makes about who he is so we can get to know him. But here today, we're going to look at his statement that says, I am the bread of life. Because Jesus is going to make a claim about who he is and what he does for anybody who will follow him. So today we're going to go to John chapter 6. We're going to try to understand what this means, that he is the bread of life and how it blesses us to come in relationship with him. John chapter 6 begins with a very familiar story. It's Jesus is teaching a crowd of over 5,000 people. They're hanging on to his every word. And then Jesus does something very surprising. He tells his disciples, why don't you feed these people? Which they say, we can't, we don't have any food. We have five loaves of bread and two fishes. And so Jesus is going to do what the Bible calls a sign or a wonder. A sign or a wonder in the Bible always points back and authenticates who Jesus is. That he is not just a man. That this is the man of God, a God man on the earth. So with these five loaves and two fish, you probably know the story. Jesus blesses them. They pass them out. Over 5,000 people are fed. People ate as much as they wanted. And then there were leftovers. There were more leftovers than when they even started feeding the people. And this really brought the people into sort of a frenzy. You see these football games where some team hasn't beaten another team in like 85 years and they finally win a game and everybody crowds down into the stadium this is sort of what the scene might have been like the people are in a frenzy after this miracle and they're crowding around jesus and the bible says they want to make jesus king right right then and right there but jesus knows that this is not the plan and so he slips away by himself into the hills the next day the people are looking for him like where's jesus and they finally find him on the other side of the lake. And it's here that Jesus is going to make this statement, I am the bread of life. But let's go to the passage and read it for ourselves. There's a, this, this passage of scripture is so deep, so extensive, but we can only have time to pick out a couple of important things out of it this morning. So we're going to pick up the story in John chapter 6, verse 22. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the far shore saw that the disciples had taken only one boat and they realized Jesus had not gone with them. Several boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the Lord had blessed the bread and the people had eaten. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into boats and they went across to Capernaum to look for him. They found him on the other side of the lake and they had said, Rabbi, when did you get here? And now Jesus is going to talk back. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. And so they're a little confused and they reply in verse 28, we want to perform God's works too. What must we do? Like, what do we have to do here? What are you asking of us? And Jesus told them, and this is very important to remember, Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. Like, that's it. Believe. Jesus here, we're going to stop for a moment. Jesus is the first one to identify what we might call consumer Christianity. Like Jesus is saying to them, you only want to be with me, not because you love me. You want to be with me because I fed you. 
You want to be with me because your belly is full. You want to be with me for what you can get out of me for the here and now. It's all about your appetites and your immediate needs and how I can meet them. You want me to be your butcher and your baker and your grocer because that's how you see me. I mean, Jesus knows that most of these people are never going to be like his disciples when they dropped their nets, left their family to follow Jesus. They're, they're not going to do that. Jesus knows that they have no intention of picking up a cross and following him. Jesus knows that they are probably not going to make any sacrifices for him. That's what we call consumer Christianity. Jesus, what can you do for me? What can you give me? Jesus, I would like for you to heal me. I want you to help me. I want you to get me into heaven. Boy, I would love for you to love me. Get me out of my jams. I, I, I need you, Jesus, to help me get a better job. Keep me fat and happy. But Jesus is saying, that's not why I came. These people want to be around Jesus so he can solve their problems. Jesus was useful to them, but Jesus was not precious to them. These people were fixated on the miracle that Jesus did, not the person of the miracle. It's like to them, this is the Jesus show. Let's all be a part of the Jesus show. Jesus, where are you going next? We want to be in that too. Well, that's how we're going to begin this message this morning. If you are here only for what you can get out of Jesus, then you have it all wrong. This is the kind of religion that is rampant in America. I love Jesus for what he could do for me. We call it the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. I'm going to give because he's going to give more back to me. I'm going to do this because he's going to do this for me. Well, these people are confused. And they say, then what do you want out of this, Jesus? What do you want? What do we have to do? And that's where Jesus said in verse 28, I, I want you to believe in me. I want you to believe. I don't want you to use me to get you to heaven. I don't want you to use me to feed your stomach. I don't want you to use me to get a better interest rate. I don't want you to use me so you can get a better job. I want you to believe in me. What does he mean by believe? It means that Jesus wants to be the center of our life that we will do everything he asks us to do. We will go wherever he asks us to go. We will live any way he asks us to live. He, he will change anything in our life that he wants to change. He will, that we will love anybody he asks us to love. That we would be believing as being convinced to the very core of our soul that Jesus is the one, that I depend on him for everything from this moment on. That's what he's asking. Well, in verse 30, they answer back. They answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? It's like, didn't you just see one? I mean, and then they go on. After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. I mean, they just want more of the Jesus show. Just feed us every day. Jesus replies, verse 32, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now, and now he's going to change the subject. And now he offers you true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us this bread every day. Let's, again, stop for a moment. Don't miss what Jesus says about the manna in here. See, manna was God's food that he sent to his people in the wilderness when they came out of Egypt. For 40 years, that food kept them alive. For 40 years, it sustained them. Without that food, they would have died in the wilderness. And now Jesus is saying, oh, by the way, remember that manna? My father wants to give you something better than that manna. And then Jesus shocks them in verse 35 with the key verse. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Like, I am the manna. I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus is saying, I am that manna. 
I never run out. I am the bread of life. Every day you can have me. And then he goes on in verse 40. For it is my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life. I will raise them up on the last day. Then the people began to murmur in disagreement because he had said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know his father and mother. How can he say, I came down from heaven? Let's skip down to verse 47. Jesus answers back, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I will offer so that the world may live, is my flesh. Jesus makes a claim here. He says, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. I am the most basic need of your life. I want to go back to verse 35 because the rest of our talk is going to be centered around this. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever, whoever, whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty now, when Jesus talks about bread here, he's really just talking about the basic sustenance of physical life. Just like the Jews could not live without the manna in the wilderness, he's saying you can't live without taking bread into your life. Now, I don't know about you, I love bread. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Especially with butter, like good butter, not that crummy stuff. But... <laughs> You know, I love bread that has slightly hard crust with some seeds on the outside. Now, I know some of you here today, like you're like on the no bread diet. I can't eat bread. Bread's evil. It's of the devil. But the way Jesus is using bread here is just synonymous with food in general. Jesus is just saying that you have to take something physically into your body in order to live physically. But now Jesus is turning the tables and he's saying, oh, by the way, you need to take something into your spiritual body in order to exist. He's saying just like you have a physical craving for food, there is also built into a spiritual craving for something more. I mean, Jesus talks a lot about bread. He says in the Lord's Prayer, give us this bread, our daily bread. He talks to the devil one time and he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus recognizes that, yeah, we need physical bread for our bodies, but we also need a bread for our soul. And Jesus says, I'm it. I am it. Okay, I'm going to put that thought out of my mind and not say it. Just want to let you know. <laughs> it's like all kinds of things come into my mind, but I need to move on. We're all looking for bread. We're all trying to fulfill the hunger that's inside of us. And you know, everybody's telling you where to find bread. But this hunger that you feel for something more, this was placed in you by the Creator. The first moments that you become aware that you're hungry for something more in your life, when you get these cravings, you decide, I need to satisfy them. And at first, you might think, well, if I just get the right group of friends, that'll do it. I'll be in the cool club. And then it's like, if I could just get that girl, that'll do it for me. And then it moves on, like, if I could just wear the right clothes, That'll do it. I won't be hungry anymore. That'll satisfy. Then it's like, if I could just get a cool haircut. Then it's like, if I could just get enough Rogaine to regrow my hair. <laughs> then it goes to like, if I could just smoke and drink and be cool like that, that'll do it for me. If I could just get a job and some money, that'll do it. If I could just get a car, that'll do it. 
If I could just fit into those tight jeans, that'll do it. If I could just get those shoes. Now I want to stop and say, I threw this in just for Linda. She's got a shoe porn fetish. If I could just get those shoes, that'll do it for me. If I could just curate a look, or if I could just curate my profile, if I could just curate my platform, that'll do it. If I could just get into the right school, if I could just make this amount of money, if I could just live in that neighborhood, if I could just have that career, if I could just get that promotion, that'll do it for me. If I could just get married, if I could just join that club, if I could just get married again, if I could just lose 20 pounds, that'll do it for me. If I could just have a baby, if everybody would just leave me alone, that'll do it. If my team would just win the national championship, I know I would be happy then. If I could just get to retirement, if I could just be a somebody to someone, but the list just goes on and on and on. And the problem is with all of us in this room is we try to take good things and turn them into God things. We tell things, fulfill me. Marriage, fulfill me. Children, fulfill me. Job, fulfill me. And we take the things that we accomplish in life or the things that we buy in life or the pleasures we get out of life and we ask them to do what only God can do for us. And the whole time that you're alive in this world, you're being manipulated and coerced and, ma and somebody's manufacturing desires so that you can try to meet your own needs. That's the whole world of advertising. If you just had this, you would finally make it. But we are all hungry people. We're all thirsty people. God gave us, by the way, all of these things to enjoy in life. But you can only love things according to the worth that they have. You should never expect the things of this life to provide ultimate meaning. They can't do it. And our problem really is this, that our appetites never, ever get satisfied. You've never had a meal and you said, that's it. I've tasted perfection. I never need any more food. Nobody's ever looked at pornography and said, I've just seen it. I've just seen the ultimate picture and I never have to use this anymore. Rich people who have more than enough to last four lifetimes. It's like, if I could just have a little bit more. Alcoholics never say, well, that drink, that did it. I'm satisfied. Even these aging rock stars who can't even sing anymore, but they're out there like, if I get one more round of applause, maybe that will satisfy me. You see, the dilemma is this. We have a desire inside of us that we cannot fulfill no matter what we do. And the desire that's in us was placed by God. It's called eternity in your heart. And it's a desire not for things. It's a desire for a relationship with God. We all know it. We've been created for something more. We know that. It's in us. There's an aching in every one of us here today that there's something that's got to satisfy me. We sense that there is some destiny for us. There's some relationship that we were born to have. And Jesus shows up and he says, I'm the bread of life. And if you come to me, you'll never be hungry again. All of your desires are pointing to me. And I can satisfy your hungry, hunger. Jesus didn't say that religion was the bread of life. It's not. He didn't say money was the bread of life or your family was the bread of life. He didn't say sex was the bread of life or philosophy was the bread of life. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, me alone, not me plus those other things, just me. Now, could this possibly be true? And once again, Jesus doesn't make it difficult. What Jesus says is, listen, if you want to know if it's true, then believe in me. Because when you believe in me, something is going to happen and you will get the true heavenly life, eternal life, satisfying bread that I offer. You'll get it now and you'll get it for others. That's what he says. The conversation sort of goes on in the passage, and I want to wrap this up, but Jesus says, I'm the bread of life, back to John 6, 35, I'm the bread of life, 
Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And that, down to verse 52, all the people, you know, they don't know what all this means. Uh, the people begin arguing with each other about what he meant. How can this man give us his flesh to eat, they asked. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person up at the last day. If you look at that passage today, that sounds a lot like communion. It's because it's a lot like communion. But Jesus is just telling him again, I'm providing you something. I'm giving you bread that satisfies you. I'm providing you an experience that you will never hunger for anything else. You will never thirst for another thing. Jesus says, I am that experience. Isaiah 55, 1 says this, Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. Come and take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me, and you will eat what is good. You'll enjoy the finest food. See, Jesus this morning is just inviting us to eat. No money is required. It's free. Come and take it. Scoop it up and put it into your pocket. We used to know this lady named Inez. She was a little weird for certain, but she got kicked out of every buffet in the city because she scooped things up and put it in her purse. But here Jesus is saying, scoop it up. Put it into your pocket. Don't stand there looking at the table. Sit down and start eating. Jesus is the bread to be taken into your body, and he will save your life. Jesus, like real food, is going to nourish your soul. Jesus is going to heal your whole self. He'll save your body, your soul, your mind, your heart, your emotions, your future. He'll save you from your past. And when you consume Jesus, you will get heavenly life. Again, John 6, the true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. You might say, I already, I'm already alive. But Jesus says, oh, well, do you have heavenly life, though? Yeah, you got physical life, but do you have heavenly life? Has something eternal come into you? Has something from above come into you? something that satisfies you in the deep longing of your soul, the peace of your life that is missing, do you have that? Because Jesus says, that's me. Now, this is dangerous, but I, I thought, what does eternal life feel like? So I just got a little list for you, to, and we'll finish with this. Here's what eternal life feels like. All the old things are passed away, and behold, everything's new. Eternal life feels like, Paul said it, You've been raised from the dead. It feels like transformation. It feels like you've been invaded by a spirit from above. The all-encompassing presence of Jesus is with you. What does it feel like? You feel born again. You feel loved. You experience freedom. You're washed. You're baptized in the spirit. There's a sense of the spirit bubbling up inside of your heart. What does it feel like? We are full. We are overflowing. Our apathy to spiritual things is gone. We sense we belong to God. Peace floods the soul. We see things differently. We begin to experience the pinnacle of human existence, God living in us. What does it feel like? It feels like that our body is now a temple of the Spirit. Sometimes tears flood our eyes, but other times there's shouts of joy from our mouth. What does it feel like? It feels like we have found something that other people are missing. It feels like belonging. It feels like I've been blind, but now I see. I've been deaf, but now I can hear. I've been in prison, but now I'm free. I've been earthbound, but now I'm heavenbound. It feels like love. It feels like God's wisdom and counsel and power and his glory and his words and his grace and his faithfulness are now for you. It feels like I know this God who's making all things work together for good on my behalf. That's what it feels like. Psalm 34, 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. 
I'm not talking, you know, when I talk about being with Jesus, you, know, you might be thinking, oh, he wants us to have a quiet time. No, taste and see that the Lord is good. This is not quiet time. This is delight time. This is feasting time. Slurping, lip smacking, dropping food on your clothes. That, you know, using a napkin because it's getting all over the place and your soul is happy in Jesus time. That's what we're talking about. He is the bread of life. Let's stand. Father God, we want to take this moment to pray and kneel at an altar. Because you are the bread, you're offering us yourself. Lord, I know there's, there are people here that have just been consumer Christians. Jesus, what can you do for me? Today, Lord, let them believe and get all of you. Not a facsimile of you, but all of you. Lord, this is your promise. I am the bread. You will not hunger anymore. How I have found this to be true. And I know there's a whole room of people who would say amen that this is their experience. Help us to come and be with you every day and receive this bread. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, Riverside. It's time for announcements. Riverside Church has participated in Angel Tree for many years. This is a project where we adopt certain families in our community and we buy them Christmas gifts. Last year, we bought one family who had 13 kids their entire Christmas. Angel Tree will be set up in the lobby of the church in November and you will get a chance then to participate in this great ministry to our community. Please consider being a part of this. Riverside Church is offering a Bible study for youth in the Upstairs Youth Room. We'll cover the basics of reading the Bible, how it all connects, and how to defend your beliefs. It's also a chance to ask questions about things you've read. What to bring? A Bible, pen, pencil, a notebook, and a snack or drink if desired. This is our third year of doing Advent bags with our children and kids ministry. As usual, they will get their own bag with lots of activities and fun things to do. Their bags are marked with a snowflake with their names on the snowflake. The family also gets a bag this year and these are family activities that everybody does together. Advent will begin December 1st, but the bags will be given out the Sunday before, which is the last Sunday in November. Holiday season is here and here are some need to know dates. On November 28th, the church office will be closed for Thanksgiving. On December 22nd, our Riverside kids will perform their musical during the second service and have a birthday for Jesus right after. On December 24th, Christmas Eve, we will hold a service at 6 p.m. And on December 29th, we will hold one service at 10.30 a.m. On January 5th, you are invited to join us for communion. We will also have life group events, ways to volunteer, and so much more. So keep an eye on our website, the app, and social media to stay connected with Riverside this season. We're excited to offer you a convenient way to stay in touch with Riverside Church. Download the Church Center app from the App Store to access event information, signups, and stay updated on everything happening at the church. It's a perfect tool to stay plugged in with just a few taps on your phone.